Hello everyone and welcome back to Red Eagle Politics. Make sure you like this video down below and subscribe if you're new. And today we're going to be talking about arguably the best state in the union, the great state of Texas. Texas has long been the bulwark for the Republican Party in recent elections. Without Texas, Republicans would have lost every election after 1988, and in some cases, they would have lost badly. Texas is a state with a very rich and long history and it is arguably different from many other U.S. states in that regard. While the Panhandle was a part of the Louisiana Purchase, the rest of Texas still belonged to Mexico until the 1830s, and it was not originally conquered by the United States. Instead, Texas fought for its own independence, delivering a brutal blow to Mexico at the Alamo, and defeating them for good at the Battle of San Jacinto. Texas then became its own country, the Republic of Texas. Texas nationalists fought with annexationists such as Sam Houston over whether the United States should annex Texas, and in 1845, under President James K. Polk, Texas was officially annexed as a part of his vision for Manifest Destiny. However, West Texas was still under Mexican control until after the Mexican-American War, which got Mexico to cede all land that today is on U.S. soil. Polk was undoubtedly one of our greatest presidents, a diamond in the rough, and it's a shame he doesn't get enough credit for it. That's a little bit besides the point of this video, but I felt like I had to say it anyways. Texas was a bit reluctant to secede during the Civil War. Their governor, Sam Houston, refused to swear an oath to the Confederacy and was forced out of office as a result. Texas rejoined the Union after the war in 1870. Because much of its economy was not driven by slave labor, Texas was not hit as hard as some of the other southern states due to abolition. Railroads revolutionized transportation at the turn of the century, bringing even more jobs and people to the state. The 20th century was crucial to Texas's development with the production of oil. The Texas oil boom, or the gusher age as many will call it, allowed the U.S. to overtake Russia in terms of production of petroleum. Many more oil reserves spawned up all over Texas, allowing for cities such as Houston and Dallas to grow from small cities to some of the largest in the country over the span of just a few decades. The state went from a more rural state to an urban and suburban one, as many jobs were brought to the city centers after the oil boom. Texas continued to thrive after the end of the Great Depression to the end of the 20th century. At the turn of the millennium, more businesses relocated their headquarters from California to Texas, changing the industries in some of the key metro areas. Immigration also increased significantly, and the state became majority minority in 2003. Hispanics will soon be a plurality in the state, even. This rapid change in recent years, as well as tightening election results, have brought uncertainty to the state's political future and Governor Greg Abbott has been insufficient at fully stopping the change, sucking up to big tech companies at every turn, who have brought in many jobs that have undoubtedly moved the state left. Now that we've analyzed the state's history, it's important we take a look at the political history of the state of Texas. Texas was a blue state from its entrance in the Union until 1928, with the one exception of voting for Democrat-aligned liberal Republican Horace Greeley in 1872 over Ulysses S. Grant. So technically from 1848 to 1924, it voted against the Republican. The state flipped red in 1928 as Herbert Hoover decimated Al Smith nationwide. Still, the state only went red by a few points, but that was the first hint of the political realignment that would see the South flip red and the North flip blue. Many attributed Hoover's victories in the South to quote-unquote anti-Catholic bias against Smith. Although the state would have no problem electing Catholic John F. Kennedy to the presidency 32 years later. The election of 1928 really signaled the rise of the northern elitist Democrats and was the start of a realignment that would soon impact the state of Texas as well. The truth is that Al Smith did better in the Deep South and Northeast compared to everywhere else, and ironically arguably did better in the non-Catholic regions of the country than the Catholic ones. He also lost his home state of New York that elected him governor by a landslide. So while anti-Catholic bias probably hurt Al Smith a little bit here and there, it was far from the main factor of his loss. Texas voted heavily for FDR four times, as well as for Truman in 1948. Things changed, however, when in 1952, they elected Dwight D. Eisenhower by a likely margin and re-elected him in 1956 by a safe margin. 
The industry changes to the state as well as the increasingly liberal social values of the Democrat Party pushed the state into Eisenhower's hands, Ike definitely made inroads in the South, and Texas was arguably ground zero for that. Kennedy won a very narrow election victory in 1960 in the state, bolstered by Texas Senator LBJ's presence on the ticket. After Kennedy's assassination, which ironically took place in the state of Texas, Lyndon B. Johnson defeated Goldwater there by 27 points. The state even voted to the left of the nation, and broke with the Deep South, which voted Republican for the first time since Reconstruction. Many will attribute this feat to an instantaneous party switch of sorts, but the truth is that the South became Republican over the span of 70 plus years. Still, Goldwater was a symbolic vote of Southerners angry at the Johnson administration for the passage of the Civil Rights Act and for economic reasons as well. It's ironic seeing a bunch of Southerners who historically were fairly left-wing economically but right-wing socially vote for a libertarian from Arizona who was a member of the NAACP, but politics isn't always about the person. Texas, however, broke from this trend along with the state of Arkansas, but that was mainly because of Johnson. Texas also went blue in 1968 voting for Northern Liberal Democrat Hubert Humphrey over Richard Nixon and Dixiecrat Independent George Wallace. In 1972, however, the tables were turned as Nixon won a 2-1 landslide over McGovern in the state. The last hurrah for Democrats in the state was 1976, their last win to date, when Carter beat Ford by four points in the state in a really strange and weird electoral map. Reagan won convincing victories in the state in 1980 and 1984, cementing the state in the Republican column. The state voted to the right of the national environment both times as well. Former Texas congressman turned VP George Bush was on the ticket both times, and he won the state in 1988 running as Reagan's third term. His opponent, Michael Dukakis, chose moderate Texas Senator Lloyd Benston to be his running mate, which helped him limit his losses in the state. Still, Bush carried the state's four largest counties, but lost Austin, El Paso, Corpus Christi, and the Rio Grande Valley. Dukakis' strongest county nationwide was Hispanic supermajority Star County, which we'll get to later. Ann Richards won the governorship in 1990, becoming the most recent high-profile statewide Democrat official in the state. If it wasn't a Democrat-favorable midterm, I doubt that she would have had much of a chance. Although, the map is a bit of a head-scratcher compared to a modern result in the state. In 1992, Texas native Ross Perot jumped in the race as a third party against Bush and neighboring Arkansas Governor Bill Clinton, who believed that with his southern appeal, he could take the state. And he did come close, falling short by just two and a half points. Many believe that Perot cut Bush's margin of victory in the state down as a result, though Bush still won by winning DFW and Houston convincingly. Clinton still won a lot of rural white counties in the state, ironically enough. Perot took just three counties in the state as well. It voted to the right of the national environment by just eight points. In 1996, Perot was less of a factor, allowing Bob Dole to win the state over then-President Clinton by nearly five points. It voted to the right of the national environment by 13, signifying its rightward trend as many rural counties got redder and the suburban shift to the left wasn't yet underway. Texas Governor George W. Bush, the son of former President Bush, became the GOP nominee in 2000, beating Arizona Senator John McCain in the nomination process. He won the state by 18 points, and still won Dallas and Harris counties. He even also won San Antonio and Austin. Bush's opponent, Al Gore, was from the South, but at this point it did not even matter, as he failed to even win his home state of Tennessee. 2000 marked the end of the Democrat Party's competitiveness in the South as a result, and the state of Texas essentially became the Republican equivalent of California. 2004 looked similar to 2000, and Bush expanded his margin of victory to 23 points, though he lost Travis County or Austin in the process. The state voting to the right of the nation by over 20 points was astounding, as Bush put up suburban margins that any Republican nowadays couldn't even dream of in the Dallas and Houston suburbs. 2008 was a tough year for Republicans, but even with a large financial crisis and a fallout of support among college-educated whites and Latinos in the state, John McCain still won it by 12 points against Obama, only a 2% trend to the left compared to the national environment. 
He won the state by less than a million votes, losing Bayar, Harris, and Dallas counties in the process. Romney won the state by 16 in 2012, nearly winning Harris County in the process. The state trended to the right even. However, it would appear to all be downhill from here for the Republicans in the state. In 2016, Republicans fed up with the establishment of their party rightfully nominated a warrior in Donald J. Trump. His bombastic, charismatic, yet sometimes crude personality made him adored by working-class white voters in the Midwest and Appalachia, many of whom have never voted Republican before. However, many white suburbanites in Texas were turned off by some of his rhetoric. Trump still won the state, but only by 9 percentage points, a 7-point swing and a 9-point trend to the left of 2012. He bled massive support in the metro areas, losing Fort Bend County, a key suburb of Houston. Down-ballot Republicans won by more than they did in 2012, however, signifying that some of that drop-off could have been more of a Trump issue than a Republican issue. Trump still improved among many white working-class voters in the panhandle, as well as the fact that he made modest gains among Hispanics living in South Texas, contrary to what most pundits in the media expected. In 2018, Democrats poured tens of millions of dollars into Texas in an attempt to unseat Senator Ted Cruz and replace him with a Latino, I, I mean Irish candidate, Robert Francis O'Rourke. College-educated white women swung heavily in favor of Beto, and the down-ballot effects were devastating for Republicans. Cruz only held on by less than three points. House Republicans only won the state popular vote by four points. Ironically enough, though, Greg Abbott was re-elected by 13 points. Now, in all fairness, it was a midterm election where Democrats had a massive amount of energy on their side. Many Republicans did not turn out, and many reluctant Trump voters didn't either. And it may seem frivolous, but it is a serious argument to make that Beto's support may have been inflated among independent women because they thought he was handsome or something. Democrats hoped to actually flip the state of Texas in 2020. Many polls leading up to the election showed it being a tight race. I thought Trump would only win it by around four points myself, based off the suburban trends and issues like COVID not really helping his case in the state. However, Trump won the state by a likely margin, winning it by nearly six percentage points. The state only trended to the left by one point compared to the national environment, as there were signs of a corner being turned. Trump only lost 0.1% of the vote from 2016 as well, proving that third-party voters may have broken in favor of Biden. Down ballot, Republicans did outperform Trump, but only by a few percentage points. Trump lost quite a bit of ground in the Dallas suburbs, he even lost Fort Worth and Arlington's Tarrant County, which he had won by nine points the cycle before. Collin and Denon counties moved left by double digits. It is true that election law changes due to COVID caused a turnout imbalance compared to past years, but we can't count on that going away anytime soon. Ironically enough, the Dallas-Fort Worth area was a statistical tie out of millions of votes cast across several counties in 2020. An impressive feat, to say the least, statistically speaking. However, the area voted for Trump by seven the cycle before. Most other major metro areas moved left too, such as San Antonio, Austin, and Houston. However, Trump did hack the map with a secret weapon. His strengths among Latino voters, specifically Tejano voters. The Tejano people have lived in South Texas for centuries. Many of them are Hispanic, yet their connection is to Texas, not Mexico. They have a strong sense of American identity, and many even identify as white. Many of them even get offended if you refer to them as Chicano or Mexican. They make up roughly 70% of all Hispanics living in the state of Texas, although the definition of Tejano varies depending on who you ask. Many attribute it to third and fourth generation Latinos that have strong roots in the state. Those living in South Texas that have been living here for centuries, however, were the ones most likely to break from the Democrat Party. Although, don't get me wrong, there was plenty of Hispanic movement to the right everywhere else in the state, but nothing like what we saw in the Rio Grande. Donald Trump ran a campaign that was pro-small business, pro-oil, pro-restricting immigration, and pro-religious liberty against a campaign that was pro-BLM, pro-child sex transitioning, and weak on the border. Many Tejano voters are culturally and economically similar to many white working class voters in the Midwest, and it seems as if their rightward shift mirrored that of some of what we saw in rural Wisconsin, Michigan, Ohio, and Iowa in 2016. 
The aforementioned Starr County, which is virtually 100% Latino, voted for Biden by just six percentage points after voting for Clinton by over 64 years prior. Zapata County, which is over 85% Latino, flipped into Trump's column after voting for Clinton by 33 points in 2016. Metro areas such as Laredo and McAllen took a 20 point plus shift to the right as well, with McAllen electing a Republican mayor earlier this summer, potentially signifying that the trend may go well beyond 2020. The Hispanic vote shift was not only present in South Texas, it's also the reason why suburban losses for Republicans were not nearly as bad as they could have been. More Hispanic counties such as Harris, Dallas, and Tarrant did not move nearly as far to the left as more white suburbanite counties such as Denton, Collin, and Montgomery. In fact, you can see the trend map right here for the Dallas Metro. A lot of the areas you see in red are plurality Hispanic. Same thing goes for Houston, right here. Harris County moved left by roughly a point or so, but it trended to the right of both the state and national environments. Vietnamese voters also played a role in moving parts of Houston to the right. Even the Hispanic parts of Austin, San Antonio, and many other cities took a turn to the right as well. The large Hispanic population in the panhandle and western part of the state helped move most of the counties to the right. The metro areas of Odessa, Corpus Christi, and Midland got even redder, just as El Paso's did. In fact, Trump won a stunning supermajority of Hispanic majority counties in the country. This impressive turn of events stunned nearly everybody, including myself. Without this surge of Hispanic support, it is unclear to say if Trump would have even been able to top Ted Cruz's margin in the state of Texas. Exit polls this cycle were undoubtedly awful, so I wouldn't use them to make my determination. But even so, they show that Trump went from winning white college-educated voters over Hillary Clinton by 31 points to winning them against Biden by 14. Bush won these voters by close to 50 for comparison. However, Trump improved with Latinos in the process as well to offset that. The suburban shift nationwide of college-educated whites, however, may deserve a video of its own. With a realignment in full swing, there is no doubt in my mind that Texas may be turning a corner, and it could stay red longer than people really expect. Not only that, it could easily have gone from an establishment Republican stronghold to a national populist stronghold too. Most of the voters moving there from out of state are actually conservatives from California, New York, and the Midwest, proving that transplants may be able to keep the state in the Republican column. Migration from Central America has slowed in recent years as well, and as a result, Hispanics have become more assimilated and more willing to vote for the Republican Party. An economically nationalist, socially conservative party that leaves behind principles of the party's past such as free trade, small government, or whatever, could easily continue to make gains with Latinos, particularly Tejanos and Latino males. Immigration is not an issue worth caving on either. Many Latinos want a tighter labor market to raise wages for the working and lower middle class. Many also want less regulation on small businesses given the fact that they own a disproportionate amount of them. This is why Trump was able to gain. And if the GOP tries to go back down the road of the Romneys or the Haley's, they are going to bleed Hispanic support massively. The Hispanic coalition has been one that has been relatively Democrat and unmovable over the years, and I don't expect Hispanics nationally to vote majority Republican. But this new economically nationalist, socially conservative coalition could easily break 40 within the decade and prove that a fast-growing voting bloc could be a swing demographic in the far future. Don't get me wrong, this is not a call to apologize for mass immigration. I think shutting down the border for 15 years or so would be great, and it would allow Hispanic Americans to assimilate at even a faster rate. That's net zero. You can bring your spouse, your immediate family over, but that's about it. Yet it's important that we regain our control of our institutions in the meantime. We need to assimilate these recent immigrants into traditional patriotic America, not hedonistic self-hating modern America. Until then, we are full. Texas was never a super white state. Even in 1940, it was only 74% non-Hispanic white and over 11% Hispanic. The reason why Hispanic voters in the state of Texas vote to the right of those in Arizona is in part because they are far more assimilated as a result. They've been living there far longer, and Tejanos are living proof of that. Irish and Italian immigrants took generations for their voting patterns to normalize. 
Many Walter Mondale voters in places like rural Wisconsin and western Pennsylvania broke heavily for Donald Trump in 2016. And that is because Donald Trump effectively communicated to them that our political system is broken and doesn't work for them, and he was the change candidate who could accelerate the political realignment like none other. On social issues, many Hispanics historically have been to the right of whites on issues such as gay marriage and abortion. On guns, the opposite is true, but it is also important to note that Hispanics have been buying more firearms as of late, which may eventually push them to the right on that issue. It is also true that Hispanics typically have wanted a bigger government with more services on average according to studies, even Hispanic Republicans or those whom are third generation. However, the Republican Party has been slowly leaving behind the principles of quote-unquote small government, whatever that means, and has been embracing things such as trade protectionism and continual funding of Social Security and Medicare. Now, it should be imperative that we continue to make our government spending more efficient than it is now, but that's a topic for another video. Perhaps we could talk about reforming the welfare state in a video about economic populism. Most Latinos in the state of Texas identify as white as well. Technically, Texas is nearly 80% white if you include them. Recent data shows that Latinos are vehemently opposed to the anti-white racial initiatives such as reparations for slavery and critical race theory, showing that when push comes to shove, Latinos may be more likely to side with white conservatives on these issues. This level of assimilation mixed with cultural similarities will help Republicans in the state of Texas, even if suburban whites are moving left off a cliff. As for the suburbs, time will tell. Trump's presence on the ballot definitely hurt Republicans, but by how much will non-Trump Republicans continue to outperform him, and what is their breaking point? I know that college-educated white men are not moving to the left as much as college-educated white women, which is a sign that a breaking point may be there. Even if it is 60-40 Dem or so, that is something that Republicans can handle and overcome by maxing their potential among white working class voters and Latinos in the state. Yet, we aren't even close to that point yet. 2018 can be discounted as a fluke, when many Republicans did not decide to show up, for better or worse. Down-ballot Republicans like Dan Crenshaw outperforming Trump by 10 in suburban Houston is also a positive development, even though Dan Crenshaw is downright awful. The truth is that people aren't really voting on the issues anymore by and large. Personality is playing a major role in politics as well, especially in the suburbs. The establishmentarian culture shift is a serious obstacle for Republicans among voters like suburban white women who are influenced heavily by television. Trump's personality was a serious roadblock for many right-leaning independents in the suburbs, many of whom voted for John Cornyn. This disparity of Biden down-ballot R voters was much higher in Texas than it was in left-veering Georgia, especially when you take the Trump-Hagar voters in South Texas into account. If Trump runs again in 2024 and inevitably nabs the Republican nomination as a result, I would firmly expect him to carry the state again, although he likely would see continued bleeding in the Dallas suburbs, particularly the northern ones. Dems are near maxed in Austin and San Antonio if the Latino shift continues, and I would expect Trump to do better among Latinos living in the Dallas area, which may be enough to flip back Tarrant County. Here is the map if Trump is the nominee. He wins the state by just over 5 percentage points, losing Collin County, yet flipping even more counties downstate. Now in 2024, I would expect Ron DeSantis to be able to stop the bleeding in the state suburbs if Trump does not run and DeSantis wins the nomination. DeSantis would win back Tarrant County and do even better in the Houston area. He would also do better downstate as well, winning the state by over 9 percentage points, higher than Trump's margin in the state in 2016. Both of these maps are against Kamala Harris. You could probably give Biden an extra percentage point or so in each map if Biden is still alive by then and decides to run. California likely won't get Texas, and the Texan culture that has kept the state unlike any other will live on, at least for another decade or so. The state has a much higher rural population compared to California, less indoctrinated whites, more assimilated Hispanics, and a somewhat competent Republican Party leadership compared to the California GOP of the 1990s. If the current trends continue, and some of the metro areas turn a corner, Texas can continue to be a bulwark for the GOP for decades to come. But let's not get complacent. 
Cautious optimism is the mindset moving forward, and we must be able to prepare for the worst by continuing to tap into the populist, rural, white working class base in the Midwest as well. Now let me explain to you why many people, including myself, have decided to move to the great state of Texas. Politically speaking, yes, it is a state that I do believe we should keep red. In fact, many conservative Californians are moving there in part for this reason. Exit polls have backed this up, saying that native Texans did support Beto O'Rourke in 2018, yet most of the people that saved Ted Cruz were actually from out of state. So yes, most of the people moving to Texas are not moving the state to the left as much as one would think, especially those who are moving to parts of the state other than the city of Austin. Transplants from the Midwest and the West Coast will likely keep Texas and Arizona from being Democrat strongholds and will also potentially make Nevada a right-leaning state as well, especially with the Democrat Party of the state being taken over by the Democratic Socialists of America. Yet, it's just deeper than that why conservatives are moving to the state of Texas. Texas is a very easy state to start a business. The state also has fairly low taxes, ranking 47th in tax burden and devoid of state income taxes. The state is a fairly low cost of living, being nearly 8% cheaper than the rest of the nation. There are fewer firearm restrictions, comparatively speaking, as the state ranks number three in terms of gun-friendly states. The weather is also an improvement over the Midwest, yet is not as extreme as places like Arizona. The sun is out far more often than the Midwest, and that is something that is biologically important for our quality of life. But what really sets Texas ahead of places like New York and California are its inherently conservative values. Texas remains far more religious than the rest of the nation, ranking above most states. It's a fairly good place to raise a family, particularly a Christian family, especially compared to a place like California. Now, I'm not sure if I plan on staying in the state long term myself, but for many others, it makes sense why they would want to raise a family here of all places. When people think of Texas, many will recall the late 1990s slash early 2000s animated series King of the Hill, focusing on a blue-collar family and their neighbors living in exurban Dallas in the fictional town of Arlen. Unlike many other adult animation shows, this one was actually set in reality. Not to mention, it is probably the most inherently right-wing TV show of all time, and anybody who says otherwise is just coping. The show's mundane nature truly captures Texan culture, and conservative values such as hard work, religion, and family were glorified, not put down. Humanizing right-wingers and middle Americans while portraying them and their ideals in a positive light is impressive, as no other show in the past 20 years to my knowledge has really done that before. King of the Hill truly arguably helped shape some of my political beliefs as well, as it rails against mega corporations from a populist perspective, pokes fun at low IQ liberals who seek to destroy tradition, and stresses traditional family values and the importance of the working class. And that seems to be relatively symbolic of the state of Texas. Texas is what California used to be, and we need to keep it that way. A conservative stronghold the bulwark against those who seek to destroy what made this nation truly great, the United States of America within the United States of America. From the banks of the Red River to the Brazos and Rio Grande, from Houston to Dallas, from El Paso to San Antonio, there lies a beacon of hope, a beacon that we actually may be able to correct course in this state and the nation as well by keeping it a bastion of true conservatism and family values. Not only that, a beacon that we could actually transform it from a more neoconservative state to a national populist one. Texas is ground zero for conservatism. We cannot afford to lose it. And with the right-leaning state of Florida, it will provide security for the Republican Party in the long run. 2024 will be a tough test for the state of Texas, whether the nominee is Donald Trump, Ron DeSantis, or even somebody else. Yet I firmly believe that a corner may be being turned. Greg Abbott will finally have a party that puts pressure on him to act in the state's best intentions, as he is being threatened with a primary challenger if he doesn't. We'll have to see. But if the left continues down this path of pandering to their new base, which they may be maxed out with in the state, the Republican Party has an opportunity to gain massively with Hispanic voters, particularly Tejano voters. Midwesterners and Californians moving to the state may not be helping the left's cause once as originally thought, and will have the opportunity to send a profound message to the opposition. 
don't mess with Texas. We can prove that Arlen, not Austin, remains the cultural center of the state. And I firmly believe we will. And that's my take. Thanks for watching this video. I plan on doing more documentary style videos like this, potentially even on future swing states, but also on candidates, key issues, and future elections. If you have any suggestions, please comment down below. Like for more videos like this, subscribe if you haven't yet, and hit the bell so you never miss another video. Follow me on social media, the links are all in the description below. As always guys, thanks for watching. Red Eagle, out.